Um, what I'm going to do today is just focus on one of the last projects that I worked on, which is called What Are You? And it's a project where I worked with the transgender, transsexual Hijra community, which is the male to female transsexual community, and specifically individuals from that community living in Bombay and Bangalore. Now, my first contact with the community happened um, when I was involved in uh, as an activist in um, you know, queer and feminist projects. And uh, I was organizing a queer film festival in Bombay. And it was my first encounter where you know, we'd been working under this rubric of LGBT rights. And then uh, just learning more about the community, I realized you know, we can't be bunched together because there are just too many differences between us, uh, which is also something which this show highlights in terms of global feminisms. So, um, the, what, what I did was, I, I was working with specific individuals of the community for about two years, and parts of it were uh, worked in collaboration with other artists, and parts of it I worked on my own, using the method of doing workshops, uh, video workshops with the community to generate material and then rework on it as an artist. So uh, What Are You as a project finally culminated in a two-channel video installation, sound, photographs, and I'll just run you through all of them. So um, in What Are You, the pliable language of gender is explored in a physical, concrete manner, not only by my chosen subjects, members of the Hijra community, male to female, transgender, and transsexual, but also through the medium itself, Moving casually between staged performances, documentary, music, video, and appropriation, What Are You creates a direct relationship to the subject's manipulation of their own gender. Now, the reason the title of the work is What Are You as opposed to Who Are You is uh, What Are You actually is, is just a short uh, excerpt from one of the interviews which was published in a human rights publication looking at violations against the Hijra community was that the community and people from the community are always treated as uh, extremely un inhumanly. So it's not who are you, it's what are you, you know, as if you are an object or an animal, somebody who is dirty, illiterate, all those kind of stereotypical associations. What are you proposes an ironic subversive vision of utopia, a utopia of perversion that is articulated through various modes and strategies of fantasy. This notion of utopian perversion is double, Entailing, on the one hand, a political utopia, a vision of a perfect egalitarian democracy, where all types of queer or perverse desires, imaginings, and social relations are allowed to flourish in the name of love. And on the other hand, the fantastic notion of a fabulous parallel world of perverse otherness, a cosmic realm of jouissance. Um, just to tell you, this is a two-channel video installation. What you saw earlier was a video still from the same uh, installation. If you can hear me, then you know I can just speak loudly. Um, and uh, the, the two screens are mounted at a slight angle to each other, and you can see the re in relation to the audience. So it's 11 minutes with color and sound. And what I'm going to show you is a, a short excerpt from the installation itself. It's a two-channel piece, so I've made a kind of edited clip where you see one channel at a time and then the... <coughs> Thank you. 
Equality before law. The state shall not deny the state shall shall not not deny deny to any person or equal protection of the law. That was about a two-minute clip, um, and I just want to share with you. I mean, it's it's a fairly long experimental piece, but um, uh, the film opens with rapidly paced shots of the beach breakers and close-ups of skin. Uh, of skin. So the uh, you know I've always been interested in sort of liminal and transitional spaces, and the beach breakers that you see are a very prominent promenade in Bombay, and it's something you know which is. Um, uh, the, what separates us from the sea and the land, and then uh, you go into the body. And next, the subjects appear full-length figures against a black void of non-association. These portraits, removed from any context, direct our attention to the physicality of several members of the transgender community. There is something unsettling in, the, in this direct confrontation. These women who are staring at us begin a recitation of their constitutionally guaranteed rights. As if suddenly realizing the absurd comicality of their performance, the jarring contradiction between the lofty discourse of the constitutional rights, democratic civil rights, and the Hidra's historical condition, the lived experience as largely excluded, discriminated against, and despised community, the women begin to chuckle and interrupt their recitation. This interruption seems to constitute the secret formula, the magician's wand that triggers the invasion of the screen with huge red roses. I just want to tell you a little bit um, why the red roses. I mean, there are several interpretations of this, but one of the interviews that I was conducting, and I asked um, one woman, her name is Revti, you know, what is the image of your life? How do you see yourself? And she said, I, I see myself as a white rose in a garden of red roses, and I have to prick myself with my own thorns in order to bleed and turn red so I can fit in with everybody. So, you know, it's those kind of associations and um, metaphors from which some of the imagery is arising. Their performance is at first a wordless pantomime, a self-identifying ironic show, an emphatically theatrical, emphatically feminine, ambiguous self-representation, come quizzical interrogation of the audience, as if to say, I am what you see and what you don't, and perhaps will never see. Who are you? So, you know, sort of, um, uh, uh, I, this is an image uh, in front of the video installation. There was a set of uh, uh, barrack style beds, um, and uh, these are um, uh, uh, beds which are found also in the red light district, which uh, uh, there are women sex workers as well as hijra sex workers. And um, uh, each of the um, I'm trying to go to the previous image, but I can't. Each of the booths contained a set of headphones which contained sound, which I will play very, very little of, um, uh, which also relates to the idea of their life as sex workers. So it is very kind of like lounge, breakbeat, but using, it's electronically worked, using a lot of the interviews and things like that. And 
And it's just says sex social work, get up, get ready, go downstairs, yeah. get a customer, come back up, and it sort of goes on a loop. Very I'll just proceed further because I'm running out of time. Um, um, and further, the work was installed. Um, I'd just like to show you. With uh, s the work was again installed slightly differently with sets of very large gilded mirrors, and again the sound is playing on the headphones, which are available for the <laughs> audience to pick up. And on the wall is a text which says, um, "I'm often seen by people as a what's that," to which I usually respond, "Isn't beautiful enough." And uh, so these are some of the installation shots. And then further, I worked with uh, three of the women who appear in the video on a series of uh, fantasy photographs. And this is the fantasy of Lakshmi, one of the protagonists. She's also a human rights activist. And uh, basically, I'd been in conversation with them about how do they see themselves in their fantasy? How do they want to, uh, in their ideal world, conceive of themselves? And you know, I always was kind of, I brought my own stereotypes. Because I often thought, you know, somebody will say, oh, I want to be a teacher. I want to be a politician. Or I don't know, something as in accessible as that, no. But the first request I got was, I wish to be Cleopatra. And I thought, well, what do you know about Cleopatra? And then I realized, of course, she knew everything about Cleopatra and has a special Cleopatra mug and all that. So <laughs> the, the title of the piece is The Bath She Sat In, uh, like a burnished um, throne burned on the water, taking from Shakespeare's Anthony and Cleopatra. And it's, it, it, it's, um, you know, it's a highly reworked image in the sense of each portrait has very much the personality of the protagonist, as well as looking at how has Cleopatra been historically interpreted, since we don't have an image of her. And then we have a consort slave boy with a court piece and all that. So these are just some of the images from the shoot itself. Uh, we actually shot on a barge in a small pond in the night, in the middle of monsoons, hoping it wasn't going to rain. It was really. Um, and then, of course, she dies with the bite of the asp uh, snake. And then this is just like a production still. Uh, this is Malini, who also appears in the video. Her fantasy was that uh, the title of this piece is um, You Too Can Touch the Moon, Yashoda with Krishna. And uh, her fantasy was to um, become a mother, and that she's pointing to the moon and telling her child that, look, even you can touch this. And um, so um, I decided to base this image on a Raja Ravi Verma painting titled Yashoda with Krishna. The reason I chose Verma's painting as a reference point of departure is because it is an uncontested fact and an irony of history that the problematic utopian vision infusing these paintings became emblematic of colonial India's fraught modernity. This photo fantasy of Malini is clearly meant to function as a perverse querying of Ravi Verma's mythological pictures and of the colonial history that produced them. Um, of course, there's a lot of attention that I paid to the art direction and detailing because it was very important that the fantasies were um, lived out to their fullest in that sense. Um, another image from the same uh, production still. Uh, that's Maheshwari. Uh, this is called Mahe uh, uh, Maheshwari, Southern Siren Maheshwari. And her fantasy was to be a South Indian film star with another hero and in a kind of dance sequence. So um, again, you know, I mean, the background is completely worked on digitally. Again, the roses appear as a reference back to the video. And then these are just some production stills, <laughs> if you can say. Mm. And that's uh, Maheshwari herself in the gallery, uh, looking at her picture or other pictures. Uh, it's also, um, yeah. Then, uh, so apart from some of the larger images that you saw, there were a number of small images in like very cheap kind of bazaar frames. And they were extremely cheaply priced because I wanted these images to proliferate. Uh, to, uh, to be out in the world and easily accessible and for people to take them. And also somewhere as a kind of gesture of you know, being in the art market and the commercial market, but still trying to sidestep it in some kind of way. So these are. OK, this is myself at my own opening. <laughs> um, what, what I decided was that you know there's a huge class difference between me and a lot of the subjects that I work with. The first one, who's Cleopatra Lakshmi, there is a less of a difference because she comes from the middle class. Her parents accept her. She's able to live with them. She had access to education. Uh, so what I decided is in, in Bombay now, India, the Indian contemporary art scene is really um, uh, 
growing and we have very elaborate openings which are completely catered you know very uh, fancy so I, I told my gallery that I didn't want any waiters and I decided to be a waiter along with a bunch of my friends and we specially uh, stitched costumes and waited the entire evening which was kind of like a performance intervention so you can see uh, and that's uh, Lakshmi Cleopatra at the opening um, that's Malini, who was the mother with the child at the opening. Some images with friends. And yeah, that's about it. Thank you.